Weezer have worked with a good slew of producers across their whirlwind of a career. From some self produced, uh, or mostly self produced outputs like Pinkerton and Maladroit, and some B sides here and there. Hmm. They've worked with quite a few outside producers. Starting with. Where did it go? Dale Johnson, who recorded Jamie in April 15th of 1993. Following that, there were the proper studio sessions with Rick Ocasek for the Blue Album, who would later rejoin the band in. Uh, 2000, 2001 sessions for the Green Album and later on again in 2014 for Everything Will Be Alright in the End and they all have a particularly punchy sound and are you know, the Green Album and Everything Will Be Alright in the End are kind of like comeback <laughs> albums of sorts with the Green slightly more prominent in that regard of it was after an actual hiatus whereas uh, everything will be alright in the end was after uh, kind of a hiatus of recorded output but not uh, actual hiatus considering Weezer toured every year in between like Hurley's release in like was that 2010 2011, something like that, and then the release of Everything Will Be Alright in the End in 2015. But after working with Rico Kasich for this first time in 1993, 1993, with the May 10th, 1994 release date, uh, they also worked, I don't know about Rick's involvement on this, but with engineer Paul Duger. They recorded on sometime prior to June 24th, and I would kind of assume sometime prior to May 10th, but I really don't know. Uh, but ultimately, the B-sides, Michael and Carly, My Eveline, and the original version of Suzanne, as I mentioned, is not the same as the one featured in Mallrats, but it's the same backing track. It's ultimately the same thing. It was just remixed later on. By the band, and I'll get back to you on who that guy was, <laughs> who they worked with for that session. But now, after Rick Ocasek, obviously Pinkerton was self-produced, and it was only in the the touching up phase where, like, uh, they brought in some help. To mix those back up again. That's when they brought Sean Everett, who they worked with a little later on. So I'll get to him. All right. So, oh, we already covered Green. Also, let's see who the sort of behind-the-scenes guy helping with their so-called self-produced fourth album, Maladroit, uh, is Chad Bramford, who. Who uh, came in during at some point during the very lengthy, <laughs> very lengthy and very well documented Maladroit sessions? Looking forward to doing that episode. Um. Yeah, so he helped that along as well as the, the sessions that started immediately, immediately after they wrapped up uh, for Maladroit, which would be uh, after April. April of 2002 is when they f put the last finishing touches on there and finished up with Living Without You. Um, it's a great, like, the only B-side for that whole album. It's kind of unfortunate. Green got a lot. Green got a whole lot. Blue got a lot. Pinkerton <laughs> Pinkerton got a beautiful amount, actually. Thank God for that. But, uh, thank Rivers for that. Um, Alright, so Sean Everett, yeah, he's, he's, no wait, Chad Branford, sorry, 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 Chad Branford, look, overseeing those early, 
album five demos, including you know the uh, Prodigy Lover, which is really really good. He was there for a good, a good period in Rivers' output. Personally, it's my it's my favorite. It's my favorite right there. I'm not gonna beat around anymore. Just Mallard's right period. Some really fluid songwriting from Rivers that I've always vibed with. Uh, okay, so after this, after this is the Rick Rubin make believe era. Rick Rubin is fresh off working all with Red Hot Chili Peppers for a long time and has, you know, history producing hip hop as well. Obviously, with the Beastie Boys and Run DMC and some random stuff here and there, and super eclectic. He worked with Danzig, of all things, and Johnny Cash, and a whole, whole slew of things. I'll talk more about him later in his own in his own dedicated episode or series. Yeah, I don't really know why I'm doing that, but once again, he worked with Make Believe and made something out of their lengthy demo process there and shuttled them in the right direction towards a proper album and he he worked with them early on for the Red album as well but somewhere in there I guess maybe commitments to the Red Hot Chili Peppers I don't really know the full story here maybe, maybe by the time I do the, make the Red album episode I'll I'll have that nailed down. Let's see what see if I can find anything more there. But uh after after Rick Rubin after Rick Rubin's out of there they get they bring in Jack Knife Lee to steer the rest of that album there. Oh Jack Knife Lee. Who would work with like REM and Crystal Castles and Hadouken. Well, honestly, not my favorite track. My, I prefer the Ruben, Ruben tracks there, and I list off a couple of towards the end of this episode here. Um, and then that bled over into what became Ratitude, starting with Jack Knife Lee, who was going to produce the whole album this time around, and then. Again, don't really know what happened, but ultimately they brought in, like, uh, let's see, we got Dr. Luke on here, and Paul DePon on here. And Butch Walker. Yeah, Butch Walker's on there. Right? Yeah, 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 he did, if you're wondering, put me back together on there. Oh yeah, a whole whole slew of producers over in Ratitude, and then I believe yeah, let me get Sean Everett over on the Death to False Metal project of like mostly just kind of polishing off, dusting off some old recordings from the Make Believe and Red Album sessions. Uh, so stuff stuff handled by either Jack Knifley or Rick Rubin, quality stuff, I don't really, in some configurations, I don't understand why, how the Red Album came to be the way it was, and Make Believe as well, it has bewildered lots of people, and now it became the way it was, but we'll talk more about that later. Uh, so Sean Everett comes in to oversee that general project and produce the, the new stuff, like turning on the radio, and then he also handled production over the Hurley project as well. So he's pretty much he's the guy for that sound. And then we jump up back to Rick Ocasek again. We got a touring hiatus, I guess if you will, like break from the recording. And we get into everything will be alright in the end. And then after that we get a single we get a single. Uh, uh, Everybody needs salvation by Sean Everett. Quite certain. Yes, yes, Sean Everett here produced that single, 
And then we move into the White Album. My favorite of the resurgence here. Uh, produced by Jake Sinclair, who had... Uh, he, he produced, like, Fall Out Boy and Saya, or however you say your name, and Panic at the Disco and Train. And he produced their Rainbow Connection uh, cover with Haley Williams, too. I think that was well earlier, and well before they approached him for the White Album. But I need to pin down the date for that song. I don't really remember. Okay, so the White Album, Jake Sinclair... And then they go back to Butch Walker for Pacific Daydream, the ultra poppy, like super poppy, like in many regards could probably just be considered a Rivers Cuomo album, but whatever. If you hear them live, I guess they appreciate it more. I guess the acoustic versions kind of bring them out. I just kind of wish they did it for more songs because there is some stuff there that I enjoy, but ultimately the album isn't the greatest, but luckily Weezer never really stays consistent in that regard, and the Black Album's looking like it's going to be pretty good, because I like the David Siddick, the last, the most recent producer they've worked with, who was a member of TV on the radio and produced all their output, and as well as a lot of the Yeah, Yeah, Yeahs, another very cool band, both very cool bands. And uh, he produced the California Snow single that I think has kind of divided people. I'm a fan personally, but it took it took a while. I got into it, and I, what helped was kind of I stumbled across these uh, these videos on YouTube where like the center the center channels were moved. So in this case, it's kind of like that that synth that sparkly synth is no longer there, and I really like that sound. But it helped it helped me appreciate what else was going on in the song, the actual instrumentation that's going on back there, and, you know, it's fun, I enjoy it, it gets stuck in my head, and I really like, I really like everything so far that David Siddick's produced for them, I'm sure it's gonna be divisive, but, you know, I, uh, Zombie Bastards is constantly playing in my head as well, and I remember back in November, I couldn't, or maybe it was October, yeah, October, I couldn't get enough of Can't Knock the Hustle, but... So far, like, the, the other two have kind of overshadowed it and longevity in my head. <laughs> well, that's, that's all the producers they've worked with, so let's, let's go back. Let's go back through and name a couple of my favorite self-produced tracks by them. Starting with an obscure Weezer-produced ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah self-produced. I already said that. Uh, Super Friend. Super Friend. When are we going to get a full band cut of this? But ultimately, Rivers produced his own and... And it was a band version and was worked out during Pinkerton. So, I don't know. Let's wait for it. But let's something more released. Uh, I just threw out the love of my dreams with Rachel Hayden on vocals. It's such an amazing song. Glad it glad it didn't just sit in the vault and, like, surface instantly as a B-side. But, man, I'd love to see them play that. I'd love, I'd love to get to a show and watch them and wit and Especially if they got Rachel on stage with them. Like, good lord, that'd be so... Be too good! And then another standoff track would have to be, like, Burnt Jam from Maladroids. That's such a fucking serene song. Uh, okay, the best, in my opinion, produced by Rick Ocasek. I mean, Holiday and I and Only in Dreams both really showcase, like, his mastery of soundscapes, but beyond that, Sugar Booger. That's such a good track. I'm glad that didn't get cut like out of the Green Album. I'm glad that made it. it. Got its life as a B-side, and and if you listen to like the the, the leaked version of the Green Album, uh, had like earlier mixes and stuff and earlier configuration. Sugar Booger was on there along with like Starlight. It was pretty good. Definitely fit. Definitely fit the flow, and no Lisa as well. Okay, so the, uh, let's move up to the best that Rick Rubin produced. Again, in my opinion. And these are like, uh... I would have to say Dreamin', for one thing. And this is such a pity. In the other way. They're all they're all good. I, I love that sound. I don't know. It's, they're kind of haunting, in a way. 
Especially the other way. Uh, soundscapes there. Good stuff he, he did. Uh, for J Chad Branford, who worked with Mal Detroit, and again, I'll say another song from those, uh, Living Without You, and something that didn't quite make it was Don't Pick On Me. So good. Talk more about that later. Okay, let's move up to Jack Knife Lee. Jack Knife Lee. Uh, whew. Not the best selection here. Not bad songs, but uh, I'd probably have to say Get Me Some was probably the biggest standout here. Maybe Tripping Down the Freeway. Yeah, Tripping Down the Freeway off Ratitude. And uh, then, uh, ooh, doo -doo. Sean Everett. What's his best? Well, he worked on the Pinkerton Deluxe for the release, so technically he gets kind of credit for, like, Tragic Girl and Getting Up and Leaving Long Time Sunshine, but those were really self-produced back in the day. Uh, Sean Everett, the best. I love Memories. I'm a big fan of it. But... I don't know, maybe everyone. That's really catchy. It's a really good, very lightly produced song off of Death to False Metal. Uh, for, uh, let's see, Butch Walker. Probably either Put Me Back Together from Rad or uh, maybe Happy Hour. I don't know, I kind of like it. It's fun. It's catchy. It's stuck in my head. The best, the best from David Siddick, I'm gonna have to say, Zombie Bastard to this point. Even though I do really like California Snow quite a bit, especially because of that synth in the center. I just kind of wish it was more equal in the mix, so you could really appreciate all of it. But maybe I'm just not listening to it right yet. I don't know. Maybe I'll hear it through the a righteous system and gain new appreciation for it. Now, finally, let's get to Jake Sinclair. The best thing he produced is probably gonna be. Do you want to get high? Really, really captures that old school sound. But for something that captures the sound that he was pushed pushing for, which was more of the beach vibe, which I appreciate, would be Summer Lane and Junk Dory. And I'm going to leave it on that. Oh, well, but uh, if you like it, I want to know who, you, who your favorite like producer for, for Weezer would be in... And if it's different than a producer in general. Like, maybe you like Rick Rubin a lot, but maybe you don't like them working with Weezer. I don't know. That's what comments are for. Peace.